We're going to begin in Tennessee, Hawkins County, Tennessee. Five-year-old girl, take a look at her picture. Her name is Summer Wells. We've been covering this one for a while. Uh, she was last seen June 15th of this year, June 15th. Massive search efforts. Members of that community, unbelievable. Uh, I haven't seen a reaction like this uh, since years ago down in, in Orlando, Florida. Uh, folks are concerned. Folks want to find uh, this little angel. But she's been missing since June 15th. Her mother, Candace Wells, um, spoke to WJHL. They shared the interview with us. Explained what happened the moment, the day that Summer Wells was last seen and when she went missing. Listen closely. Me and my mother and her were planting flowers. And we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay, and I walked her all the way over to the porch and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes I came back and I asked the boys where their sister was and they said, she went downstairs mom to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times and I didn't get no answer which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. All right, a couple things, right? So she walks into the house, goes into the kitchen. The boys say she goes downstairs to the playroom and then mom comes back in two minutes. Now, her, yeah, she might be estimating it. She might not be exactly right, but she comes back very quickly and she's gone. I mean, it, it happened that fast, uh, according to Candace Wells, uh, Summer's mom. So let's go back to the scene. I want to show you a photo first. This is a photo of the house. Let's take a, a close look at this, because when I first heard this story, and if we could drop the uh, letters on the bottom so we get a clearer look at everything. Um, you, you look at the house here, and, and I, I looked at the house, and when I first heard that she went downstairs, I was wondering, is there a... Is there a door? Is it a walkout basement? But as you can see from the cinder blocks, it's, it's not deep enough. There is no door. There are some windows uh, on the bottom, but the, the back door, that's the back door. So if she goes in the front and mom is hanging out around the front or somewhere out there and she exits the home, uh, it would have to be through that door. Because in this shot, you can see it, it was, it almost looks like there's doors over there on, on the basement, but it's not. Those are windows. So the only door is over there, which looks like the back door. Let me bring in our special guest joining us as we take a look at these uh, pictures and, and think about um, what happened here. Joseph Scott Morgan is with us, uh, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, former senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office and forensics media analyst. Also joining us in Chicago, Illinois, private investigator Erica Morse. Uh, great to see you both. Joe Scott Morgan, I'm going to start with you with the, the picture. Let's put that picture back up of the home. Um, as you look at that home, if in fact she goes in there, um, it seems to me she'd have to exit out that back door, and within two minutes, um, she's, she's got to be gone. Like gone, like yeah. not in the yard. She's got to be in the woods somewhere. Yeah, it all depends on points of, of entry in this in this dwelling. If that is a single point of entry and the one that the mother would suspect that she would have to exit from, you can see the large wooded area to the rear. So my thought is this, Finn, uh, one of the things that I'm kind of toying with, was there somebody that potentially had gained access to the interior of the house that may perhaps have been lying in wait for this little girl? that had access to her, that had identified her, uh, maybe over a protracted period of time, maybe they were watching for the wood, through the woods, just to see if they had an opportunity. And once maybe perhaps they made entrance into the house, uh, they could have snatched her at that point, or they could have waited until she exited. I think one of the keys here is observance and collection of any kind of physical evidence within that dwelling that cannot be associated with anyone or tied back to anyone 
that is domiciled there, any kind of stranger DNA that might be in there, say, for instance, touch DNA that has been left behind, of course, that would mean that the scene would have had to have been secured and that they could have tested for it at that moment in time. Erica, your thoughts about the, the initial part of the story that within two minutes, she's out of that house. Um, it, it seems to me she would have had to have gone out the back door because I think if she went out the front door, someone would have seen her. Um, so if she snuck out the back and was an adventurous five-year-old, she had to make a beeline uh, for the wooded area. Correct. And, and I think if she had left on her own, um, I think she would have been found by now. There would have been some indication of that. Um, remember, they are still looking for a uh, Toyota Tacoma in regards to this situation. Um, so this really does feel planned to me in some way or another. Um, the the property itself is very rural. Uh, I don't see this more as a crime of opportunity. I see this as somebody, you know, like um, like was already said, where uh, someone was either lying in wait or or identified that, that a child was in the house um, because I just don't think there was enough time for someone to have inadvertently driven up, walked up, grabbed her and gone. Um, you know, mom's passed a polygraph test. That is fantastic. Um, so now they've ruled her out in that regard. Um, they can start spreading, you know, spreading a little bit further. I am also equally encouraged by the fact that Texas EquiSearch is involved, or I'm sorry, Midwest EquiSearch. Um, and they're good. They're really good at what they do. And they have a lot of different technology to use. And so I think that their focus is probably going to be that wooded area and some others. Yeah, they're coming in over the weekend. Let's take a look at a really wide shot to give you a, another perspective here, Joseph. Um, as, as you can see where the house is, there, there are no neighbors there. There's no neighbors. And that arrow again is pointing to that same door that we've been pointing to in the other pictures. Um, I just look at, so isolated, Joseph, so yep. isolated. That's what is so striking to me. Yeah, it is. And this is one of the things uh, regarding what Heather had stated, that this is, uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, a planned event. This is not something uh, where she's in a large metropolitan area. Someone would have, first, to, first off, would have had to have known that this residence was back there. So as an investigator, you begin to think about that. Who would have access to this area? Who would know how to get there? Who would know the points of entry and exit and where they could make their way through there without being seen? So it requires some indwelling knowledge and familiarity with that specific area. I hope that the wooded area around there was kind of locked down. The reason is, is if there was a point where uh, an observable point where an individual could have been laying in wait, for instance, they may have stayed there for a while. And as a result of that, they could have left evidence in that specific area, say cigarette butts, candy wrappers, footprints, anything like that. So it has to be thoroughly searched. And, and that's the key to all of this. I agree. I don't think she just wandered off in a straight line and left. Remember, she's barefooted, Ben. Uh, she's not going to make it very far. She might be just sitting in the woods crying in the short period of time, I think somebody got their hands on her. Okay, Erica, if someone is lying in wait, and, and we're looking at all these incredible images that we're getting uh, to really get an idea of what this area is like, um, what's the escape? How do they escape? Do they park down on this, this road and then walk up and, and wait in that wooded area around the house? Um, how do you get from, okay, there's a, there's a girl a little girl alone in the house or steps out of the house, I grab her and then I get completely out of the area um, and, and no one sees me. Well, um, we don't know uh, who made the tip or the report regarding the Toyota Tacoma. And that would be a key aspect to me looking at this from an investigative standpoint because where that Toyota Tacoma was spotted could tell us whether or not somebody was lying in wait potentially. Um, they have not said if this is a witness or a suspect or a person of interest, I should say. And um, so the 
the location of where that vehicle was seen that is of such key uh, keen interest to investigators is something I would really be interested to know. Um, because if it was a mile away, then someone had to potentially uh, grab Summer and walk or dart. Um, that's why you always start at that last known location and work your way out one mile, two mile, three mile, four mile, five and six. Um, because there is, um, again, there's physical evidence that can be found in those locations if somebody is kind of stuck. And I recall dad saying from his previous interviews that he wished they had cornered off or locked down that area sooner. I do remember him getting very upset because that area had been almost not locked down enough. Um, and so I think there's a concern that somebody could have waited and gotten out. Um, and again, I would go back to the location of where that vehicle was allegedly spotted, because if it was too close to the house, that could be a getaway vehicle. All right, we've got two more angles of the house that I, I want to put up on the screen as, as we continue to examine um, the scene of where all this took place. And again, we're looking here, we're going to look here at the house and again, the red arrow going to that, that back door that we're looking at. And you can see on the other side of the house, there, there's a little mobile unit there um, that is on this part, it's off to the right. But as you, you look there, I, I, I guess you could make a quick exit and not necessarily be seen because the woods are relatively close and it's, a, it's that small window of time. Um, what are your thoughts in, in speaking with witnesses through the years on their ability to accurately kind of remember concepts of time? Because mom said, you know, within two minutes. Joseph, do you think it was actually two minutes? Do you think it was, could have been 10 minutes? Do you think it could have been less time? How, how accurate generally are witnesses when they recall a, a time period like that? Well, I think the first thing you have to do, Vin, is remember this, the initial information came in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the brothers. And so that's the, that's what mom had said, at least. And so that's important to kind of uh, peg them down relative to when they actually last saw her and how do they measure time in, in their young minds? Exactly how do you put a measure on this? So you have to do this in kind of a plus or minus fashion here. Uh, also, uh, relative to access and how quickly could you make your way out of there. Now, if, if it's a frenetic environment, disorganized, maybe mom doesn't always have accountability relative to the kids. It, it's out in the country. You know, kids can just roam and rip and roar and that sort of thing. I know I did that when I was young. Mom might not remember specifically. And as you go down this timeline, as you move down linear time away from that critical point, memories become uh, very faded. That's why it was very, very important for law enforcement to get to her as expeditious, expeditiously as possible and grab that uh, that that kernel of, of, of current information because as time goes along, it'll begin to layer and her memory will change over a period of time. So you have to go back to those initial statements and check them for the veracity. Erica, what are your thoughts about the boys and and their recollection of what they saw, what they heard, and how you can get information from someone that that is that is young um first of all they sh they would have brought in i'm sure someone specialized in talking with and interviewing children um uh, it's definitely someone with a social service background in conjunction with law enforcement who is perhaps someone with a child forensic psychology background who could really extract that information properly um because children do perceive time differently than adults do um they may not even be watching a clock they ha i believe i may have read a report about video games being involved that can easily distort time. Um, so you would want somebody who specializes in understanding how to ask the questions of these children, depending upon their ages, and um, to how to get them to recollect things more, uh, more accurately. Additionally, something I wanted to note, um, the number one challenge that any parent of a missing child has reported to me throughout the years is the ability to accurately remember time. Once a parent is told that their child is missing, time stops.
And so uh, nailing down that timeline can be challenging. When you hear something like two minutes, it could be 15. It could be five or 10. It's it's hard to determine. Um, I think that they're probably doing the best they can and, and getting to mom as quickly as possible was a key aspect of this. Um, interviewing those brothers and nailing down just to the millisecond, honestly, um, is gonna make all the difference in the world. But time is something that is very difficult when a family is in shock mode. All right, and as Erica mentioned, uh, Midwest EquiSearch uh, will be there this weekend. So uh, we'll see if there's any updates uh, that, that happen and we're gonna stay on this story. And, and hopefully this does not uh, become a story that we're talking about five years from now. You know, where is Summer Wells? But when we come back, we're going to be talking about where is baby Jacqueline. And this is a story that goes back 20 years. A mom is at a swap meet, a flea market, and she's got two little children. One's a baby, and, and the other one, you know, is walking around, uh, but has to go to the bathroom, and they only have the porto potty. Mom puts the baby down outside the porta potty, goes in with the other child, and like that, Baby Jacqueline is gone. We'll dive into that story.